So today I'm going to talk to you, um, oh, I am aware that this is the last talk, so I am bet bef uh, between you and free beer. Um, if you're online, maybe you're, you're already on the beer. Um, nothing wrong with an afternoon Saturday beer. Of course, you might be um, Saturday morning where you are. No judgment here, that's fine too. Um, I'm going to talk to you about fluid typography and its role in design systems. So I'm going to try and keep you awake. Um, so I thought I'd start by showing you these magnificent Blue Note jazz album covers. Um, now, I'm not the world's biggest jazz fan. I do have an appreciation for it, but I do love these covers. And you may have heard of a designer called Reed Miles. Uh, it's a great jazz name, but he's not a, a musician. Um, not even close, actually. But he is most famously associated with the designs of the Blue Note covers. And some of his designs are in here. But actually, most of these ones were designed by a chap called Paul Bacon in the 1950s. Um, and they set the scene for Reed Miles' work. Now, of course, the sound of Blue Note Jazz is as distinctive as the album covers themselves because they feature some of the very best jazz musicians that the world has ever known. Um, and the thing about jazz, especially from this era of the 1950s, the bebop era, um, is that so much of it is improvised. And the way that that happens is there's a set of agreements amongst the players up front, whether that be time signature, um, a chord um, sequence, maybe a melodic hook, a set of agreements and foundations, and then they're away and they can improvise. And just as these harmonics are foundational to jazz improvisation, so we have in our world type, spacing, color being foundational to systematic design. Um, and so long as you have those agreed fundamentals, you can start improvising yourselves and you can riff um, on designs and keep those designs in harmony with one another. Now, of course, um, type, typography, and type scales is often associated with music or compared with music, spoken of in the same sort of sentence sometimes. Um, and a scale, as defined or explained by Robert Bringhurst, um, a Canadian poet and typographer who wrote what some consider the typographer's Bible, the elements of typographic style. He described a scale simply as a prearranged set of harmonic proportions. And this is the classic type scale. The interval is 1.2. That means that each subsequent larger um, type size is 1.2 times um, the previous size. And if you've been to an online type scale generator ever, um, you'll know we also describe type scales in terms of musical terminology. So this interval, 1.2, is also known as A minor third. And the reason these are mathematically equivalent is because the E flat is 1.2 times the frequency of the C, as you would be able to see in Katie's oscilloscope. <laughs> now, I think a question we need to ask ourselves is, um, why do we have a type scale at all? Why do we even have different sizes of type? Let's go back to some basics. Well, the answer is typographic hierarchy. And a hierarchy helps readers understand the text and users understand the user interface. Um, it helps us understand what's most important, what's least important, where new ideas start and begin, where new features start and begin. <coughs> and we also know that in modern web design, we have different sized text for the same thing on different sized screens. So why would we do that? Well, one of the reasons you would want to do that is if you think about a paperback book. Um, paperbacks are almost all the same size. The text is almost all the same size, and that's because they're used in the same way. We hold a paperback around about 30 centimeters away from our face and read it, those of you who remember reading paper books. Um, a reference book such as this, the text is much, much smaller. 
And it's mostly more, much smaller, so you can fit more text on the page. If you've got text twice the size, you need four times as many pages. And because the text is smaller, we're getting close to read it. A cookery book, however, the text is much bigger because we might have it propped up in the kitchen much further away from where we are. And it's further away, so we need to make the text bigger so we can read it more easily. Well, to put it another way... OK, one last time. <laughs> These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> So you can consider text size as an angle um, rather than a, a length, a physical length. Um, so if the text is further away, to appear at the same size, the same angle, it needs to be bigger. And as some of you may know, that's actually how deep in the CSS specifications a pixel is defined. It's defined as an angle, not as a physical length. So let's consider our readers. They might be sat at a desk with a large desktop screen positioned far away, maybe 60 <laughs> centimeters or so, arm's length perhaps, away from their eyes, whereas they may be using a phone, and phones are small. Um, <laughs> so they're held close when we're reading them. Um, and these might be, you consider these the maximum and minimum extremes of the reading um, environment, typically. Okay. And that would explain why we want to change the size of our text depending on the size of the screen. But we might also want to use a completely different type scale for different size screens. So why might we want to do that? Well, if you use the same scale on a large screen as on a small one, you start to lose the contrast between the headings. So with these small and large screens here, the text is all the same size for the headings and so on, and yet they look different. Um, so if you exaggerate the size of the headings, then actually those two designs start to look more like the same design, even though they are different. You start to be able to distinguish more easily on that large screen where the headings are and how they are different um, to each other, whereas you can do that with the smaller differences on a smaller screen. It's just the way that brains work. So when you're designing, you can consider one type scale for your minimum viewport size, i.e. when the things are close in the small screens, and a different scale for a maximum viewport size or when that screen is further away and bigger. So in our case of our small screen, this is the one that we looked at earlier on, we have an interval of 1.2. And then on the maximum screen, the larger one, we have an interval of 1.3, which means the text sizes ramp up quite dramatically, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And here's an example of a real-world responsive web page designed with two separate type scales. So we have one designed for small screens, and then another different scale with bigger, increasing text designed for the larger screen. And at some point between the two, the CSS is swapped so that you either get the small text or the large text. And in theory, that CSS is swapped out at the point the design breaks, which is why I consider that is why we call them a break point. So it's great, you've got the same underlying HTML, that doesn't have to change. But of course, now you've got two fractured situations. You have got, in effect, two designs to maintain. And also, this approach, as you probably know, is quite blunt. Um, you might end up with a relatively small device, like this one in the middle, showing a typographic scale that's really designed for something bigger. Um, and so at that screen size that's in the middle there, it's starting to fail. So a common solution is to add another breakpoint and a third design for a medium-sized screen. You might consider this, at least a few years ago, we might have considered this as designing for a tablet. And like I said, this fractures the situation even further, so now we have three designs to look after. Um, and anyway, what scale should I use for that middle one? 
Um, and how big is a medium-sized screen? And how far away is it? Because with all these different tablets, it's like, well, what do you do? You start designing for every single permutation and combination? Of course you don't. Um, because you're going to end up with loads of breakpoints and media queries in an effort to handle them all. But actually, that's what the new Creative Boom website has done. This was released around about Christmas time last year. It's a lovely design, but it has got five breakpoints. So for the most part, this works well for the reader. I think it could be a bit improved at the small end, but let's not worry about that. But to, to manage it must be a bit of a nightmare. I mean, five breakpoints means six different designs. And in this case, each one, apart from the very smallest, is a fixed width design. So this might be a magazine, and it's a very good one, but the web designer is trying to exert print-like control over everything, and the web's not like that. The web is not delivered in fixed dimensions, at least not fixed dimensions that really we can design for in advance. Because um, your readers have more control over their reading environment than you do, and that is the beauty of the web. That is absolutely how it should be. Um, now, I'm not here to tear down Creative Boom. It's a really good website. The design's lovely, and it does work quite well, but it must be a bit of a nightmare to, to actually look after. And, but seemingly, five breakpoints are better than two. So are 10 breakpoints better than five? Um, would that be better? What if you had an infinite number of breakpoints? Will that be better? Well, instead of snapping from one type scale to another, you seamlessly adjusted your typography for each and every screen and window size. Um, and I have noticed that this slide was preempted on the T-shirt there by <laughs> Dave, which is nice. Um, so that that infinite breakpoints you might call fluid typography, which for me is a combination of fluid type and fluid spacing. So let's look at fluid type and um, see why it makes things easier. Earlier on, we looked at these two type scales, one tailored to your minimum size and one tailored to your maximum size of screen. And we can use these pairs of numbers to describe those scales. So we have our viewport size, we have our base body font size, so this is the text size of the paragraphs, so the smallest is 17, and it won't go smaller than that, and the biggest is 20, won't go bigger than that. Um, and then we have our multipliers, our intervals, to give us our two different type scales at the two extremes. And now to get fluid type, what we need to do is interpolate between those for any given screen or viewport size. So this graph shows you how that might happen, sort of in numbers. So each column of dots there is a type scale. So we have our type scale mapped to our type sizes for our maximum, and then on the left-hand side for the minimum, and then somewhere in the middle is a brand new type scale, a bespoke type scale purely for that size of viewport width, whatever that might be. Now, to put it in practical terms, um, you just design the extremes. So you design the extremes for your minimum size, and you design the spacing and the type size for your maximum size, and then maths just does the middle bit. Because computers are good at maths. That's not AI bullshit, that's just normal mathematics. <laughs> And so you can get this, and yes, only designers and maybe some developers sit there resizing browser windows to marvel at their responsive behavior, but hopefully this example shows you that no matter the viewport size, um, the typography will always look appropriate and always adapt an infinite number of times just by designing those two extremes. You haven't actively designed anything in the middle. So to get that right, it obviously takes you know, skill and time, but you know, that's what designers are paid the big bucks for, yeah? No? <laughs> Can't have everything. But how does this manifest itself? 
Well, when it comes to the CSS, we kind of only need this. So this one declaration here that says, set the font size to be step zero on our type scale. So if our type scale goes from zero, which is our body size, you might want minus one, so one like for small text, up to however many larger headings you want. You can just do this, it's like, the paragraph set it to font size zero, and however big the environment is, the screen is, it's still using type zero, but we're calculating what that is. So similarly, the headings might be on different steps on the scale. So we say, make an H1 step five, make an H2 step four, use a utility class if you want to create a step three under certain circumstances. But this is, all you need is your CSS to do that. You're just deciding on a scale of naught to five, how big do you want the text to be? All the complex interpolation is done under the hood. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, where does the value of that custom property actually come from? How does that make the text responsive? Do I have to do some mad maths? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I can help you with that. Introducing utopia.fyi. So this was developed by James Gilliard and Tris Mudford at Clearleft, a um, company I've founded, design agency in Brighton. Um, but it's free, no strings attached, not trying to sell you anything other than a way of thinking, so I feel okay presenting this to you. Um, we use it all the time, lots of other people do as well. And I'll just show you how to use this and, and how it can help manifest that um, fluid type. So Utopia includes a calculator and, crucially, a code generator. So you use Utopia by passing in those values that we looked at earlier on. There's your screen size, your body text size, and your type scale for your minimum and maximum. And then it gives you a set of type scales and the CSS that works with it. So these seven lines of CSS, um, these handle all the fluid typography for all the steps that you specify on your type scale, right across the two extremes of your design space, just these seven. Now, it looks a bit complicated, but the point is, you can just copy and paste it. It's foundational, you don't ever have to change it. And if you have this, then that's all you need to use those custom properties I was showing you earlier on, where you say, make all paragraphs, text size zero on the scale. Now, there's probably quite a few technically minded people um, and accessibility people in the audience. So you might have seen, yes, this uses clamp function. And when you're using clamp with type sizes, that can be problematic. Um, however, you'll also see that it's using rems rather than pixels. So anytime a user wants to change their default text size, that's handled automatically within this. Also, on the circumstances where clamp does cause a problem, which is basically extreme type scales on very large screens, Utopia will give you a warning if you're setting yourself up for that particular situation. But it's fairly rare, but it is possible, but at least you have the warning to maybe not be quite so radical. But also, you can just switch to old school CSS locks. There's an option to do that. So instead of clamp, it's a more complicated, but again, just copy and paste once job using um, pre-clamp CSS, if you like. And it's got some options to use containers rather than viewports, plus also exporting as uh, post-CSS or um, SCSS as well, which Tris has introduced more recently. So there's lots of stuff, flexibility there in terms of how you want to use this, um, this output. But the important thing is seven lines, in this case, of CSS pasted once as a foundational thing you never have to touch again then gives you the, the power. So let's think about designing a basic component um, in a design system or just like on a web page. Um, now, if the designer and the developer, who may or may not be the same person, are talking to each other and they're both thinking fluid design, the decisions are really quick. It comes down to, again, that heading on a scale of 0 to 5, how big do you want it to be? 
Similarly, the paragraph text, the button text, on a scale of 0 to 5, how big do you want it to be? That's as far as the conversation really needs to go. The rest of it is handled because you've got fluidity, you've got responsiveness all built into the, the back end of it. You just need this simple bits of CSS to make that happen and it will just work. There's no media queries there. There's nothing like that. And you might notice something else about the cards. The spacing changes too. And rather than jumping at a certain breakpoint, the space can fluidly interpolate between your minimum and maximum as well. Now, in isolation, it might not be so impressive, but across a whole page, the difference is clear. So in this example, each piece of space is accounted for and totally fluid. And that keeps everything in tune regardless of the screen size. And going back to our friend Bringhurst again, he says, add and delete space in measured intervals. And those measured intervals will ordinarily um, be related to type size. So space in design should have this connection to type, space, to type size almost always. So you could use the exact same custom properties to set your space. The same type sizes. You know, set a margin to be type size zero, something like that. Um, but um, for spacing, you'll probably need some finer grain control. So Utopia has a spacing generator as well. And this is based on the type scales that you set in earlier on, and it uses type scales as that basis. But instead of a scale, a modular scale from 0 to 5 or whatever, it uses t-shirt sizes. And those are based on multiples of the base font size. So just in this case, it sets out small as being the base font, font size, so large is two times that size, and so on. So if we look back at these cards, we can just use a space property instead. So this is saying use the small space property that we set up earlier on. And so that automatically makes the padding around the larger card bigger than the smaller card. Just, and that's it. You're just doing it with one line. So again, that conversation is just as simple. It's like, in terms of t-shirt sizes, what do you want the padding to be? Extra small, medium, large, what do you want it to be? And it'll flex automatically across your minimum and maximum design space. But spacing can sometimes be much more dramatic than that. Um, so with Utopia, you can generate these um, space value pairs so that on a small screen, we have our spacing is medium. But then we say, well, actually, we want it to grow to large on the larger screen. And that's still relative to your type size as well. So you can get more exaggerated changes, which gives some more flexibility with the design. And in fact, Utopia lets you do even more exaggerated ones than that. You can start as extra small at the small end and then make gigantic spacing to XL or go the other way if that's at all helpful. So all the flexibility is in there. And again, we can see one of the uses might be padding around the text, give you more breathing room on the larger screens. And so this padding, again, is just one line. With this property here, it says, at a minimum extreme, make it small. At a maximum extreme, make it 2XL. So again, we've just got two t-shirt sizes to reflect that padding. And so the conversation between designer and developer um, is really, really simple. And also the design process. Once you've worked out what you want these to be as a designer, it's a simple conversation. And it's not making the design simplistic. It is all related to type, which is how you would design anyway. Um, it's just making it simple. And the idea is that these tokens, these spacing ones, can be used anywhere, really, um, that you have any kinds of spacing, padding, margins, borders, grid gaps, you know, transforms even, anything that takes a pixel or a rem. So here's the Creative Boom website again. And obviously I couldn't help myself, I had to rebuild it. I've got nothing to do with Creative Boom, but you know. 
Um, I rebuilt an article page um, using the fluid layout and typography that we've just been looking at. So there's no media queries here. There's no breakpoints. It's completely fluid from small to big. Trying to map the designer's intent in the process. So although I did build this from scratch, it does show that you can retrospectively apply fluid typography to a design, but it's much easier and quicker to do it from the beginning, as it is with lots of things, you know, accessibility and so on is not a bolt-on, it's something you think about from the beginning, and so is fluid type. So um, I did a bit more detailed write-up of how I went about doing that, that's on the, my blog, which um, I've got a link to at the end. So for all this to work, it's vital, like I keep saying, that the designer and developer are talking the same language. So you both need to be talking in type steps and t-shirt sizes for spacing. Um, and as Tris, one of the developers behind Utopia said, a common language in particular reduces doubt around the understanding of design intention. So nothing gets lost in that conversation. And to help that, James and Tris, who are the developer and designer behind Utopia, have created some plugins um, and some design files for Figma. These are free, you'll be able to find them to get you started with the process within Figma as well, to help the designer be working in that same process. So again, that conversation, that language is the same between everyone. And they've written on the blog exactly how to use them and so on. So going back to jazz, um, as I said, the players agree on a, a time signature, um, a key and chord structure, and a melodic hook. And those are the foundations that allow them to improvise in harmony with each other, play together, improvising new passages of music, but staying coherent. And as I said, that harmonic structure in jazz is mirrored by spacing, type, and color in design. These are the agreed standards from which everything else flows. And again, it takes time and skill to get foundations right, but once you have foundations right, then you can just build and build on top of that. And so, like Miles Davis, you are free to improvise. So let's just briefly look at how fluid typography might get implemented in a real world design system. This is the design system Clearleft helped um, put together for UCL. We worked with their team there to do that. And if we look in, we'll see there's foundations. Um, you won't be able to read it unless you're right at the front on the left-hand side, but there's color, accessibility, icons, writing, space, typography, the sorts of things that you would expect in a design system. And in the typography page, here are the type, style, uh, sorry, the type steps that we were talking about earlier on, how they're defined for this particular website. And similarly, space tokens as well. So when we look at a component, like our friend the promo card, um, we can go and have a look at um, Storybook, uh, where the code is held, and see how this manifests itself. So here, you have some simple HTML with some utility classes saying step three, step one. So we've just got those utility classes there saying how big those bits of text should be. Dead simple. And then the CSS handles the spacing. So again, we've got a padding of going large to extra large, medium to extra small, sorry, to extra large, and space of medium happening there. Um, and this is a, all the fluidity, you know, that, that's all there is with, with these. There's no worry about how that's going to be handled. Um, there's no media queries built into this for that component. Um, it's all handled by that foundational seven lines. Well, probably twice that because you've got the spacing, but you get the idea of CSS that sits in a much more foundational part of it. So when they're designing components like this, the conversation genuinely is what T-shirt size for that spacing on a scale of 0 to 5, what's the type size? And you get that responsive design just built into the component. So by building fluidity into the foundations, the designer and developer 
of future components can play together and riff off that simple shared language, that shared foundation. So you get consistency, you get ease of use, all the promises that a design system might bring. Ah. <laughs> and that's it from me. Thank you very much.